Good evening, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I am the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival, and I am delighted to be joined here tonight um, by Brian Green, author of Until the End of Time, and Jan Eleven, uh, the author of The Black Hole Survival Guide. Um, we are also joined this evening by Eric Wilcots, who uh, is a colleague of mine uh, sitting on the Wisconsin Science Festival board, but he is also the dean of the College of Letters and Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the former chair of the Department of Astronomy. Thank you all so much for joining us here tonight and taking part in the 2020 Wisconsin Book Festival. Um, it is delightful to me to be able to host free cultural events and because uh, Madison Public Library and the Madison Public Library Foundation are the organizations that allow me to do so, I wanna take a moment to thank them. Um, they have been absolutely unwavering in their support of free book events throughout the pandemic and over the last eight years that we've been doing this. So uh, major thanks to them and to all of our sponsors uh, for making events like this possible. Um, I also want to just mention to viewers watching at home that the Wisconsin Book Festival and Wisconsin Science Festival are joining forces tonight to provide free copies of both Brian and Jana's books to you. Um, when I'm done speaking here, I will put a link in the bottom of your screen, a little green box right down here. Um, and you will be able to just sign up and have a book sent to you by our bookselling partners at a room one's own bookstore here in Madison. So thank you so much um, to the Science Festival um, and to Room One's Own for helping us bring free books to readers. Um, I am going to let the authors and our moderator take it away and I will see you at the end of tonight's event. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Connor, for, for the introduction and for welcoming us. Again, welcome to all the people who are participating. It's great to have you on board. Uh, we're gonna jump right into it. We've got two great guests and it's my honor to present uh, Brian Green is a professor of physics and mathematics and the director of Columbia University Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, he's also renowned for his groundbreaking discoveries in superstring theory. Uh, author of a number of books. Uh, I won't go down the long list. It's all in the, in the program. Uh, but, but I think for this event, he's also with Tracy Day. Uh, Brian Green co-founded the World Science Festival. Uh, and he's coming, us, coming to us tonight from upstate New York. Brian, welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Right. And also with us, uh, Jana Levin is a professor of physics and astronomy at Barnard College. So the two of you are across the street from one another, right across, across Broadway. Uh, she's also the director of sciences at Pioneer Works, a center for arts and sciences in Brooklyn. Uh, she's also recently named a Guggenheim Fellow. So congratulations on that, Jana, and welcome. And you're coming to us from your office at Barnard College. Yeah, I mean, Brian and I have very close offices also, but yeah, this, I, I'm here under quarantine on my empty campus by myself. Got it. Well, welcome. Glad, glad for both of you to, to join us. So I'm going to jump right in with, with a couple of questions. And, and Jan, I'm going to start with you. Um, your book title, Black Hole Survival Guide. Um, it sounds like a, a winter camping survival guide. You know, you just pack the right gear and it's going to be fine. It's an optimistic title. Uh, uh, so without spoiling anything, what do your readers expect to learn about black holes and their survival guide? Well, I mean, the idea was to have a sort of explanation of black holes that was simultaneously kind of a field guide. I wanted to imagine that you were exploring the black hole while you were learning these properties of the black hole and that the survival guide is basically written by the astronaut who, who goes on this insane pilgrimage to try to explore and study the black hole and sends back uh, missives to warn people about how best to survive a black hole. No spoiler alerts, but you can imagine it doesn't always go very well. <laughs> what, what are sort of the, the key warnings that folks should be aware of if they want to venture out? Well, some of them are very simple and some of them are, are, are pretty intricate, but like the simple one is fall into as big a black hole as possible. <laughs> because, you know, if you're standing on a basketball, you really notice it's curved. But if you're standing on a big sphere like the Earth, you hardly notice it's curved. You, you could suffer from the illusion that it's flat. And the black hole is the same way. The bigger the black hole, the more gradual the curvature, the less you'll really notice. You could, you could live for a little while while you fall across uh, the shadow of the black hole or the event horizon. Um, so there's little tips like that. Got it, got it. And you do get into, in the book, you get into some 
some description of, of some of the things that might happen to the body uh, and happen to, to the mind as one were to venture into, even if it's a large black hole, uh, which is a little bit, a little bit daunting. Um, but I want to turn to Brian now for a moment. Um, in your book, Until the End of Time, Mind, Matter, and Our Search for Meaning in an Evolving Universe. Uh, so a couple, couple things I want to ask you about that. One is you've got a main, it seems like you've got a main character. And entropy is is a bit of a protagonist that that comes through in the book. Uh, we see entropy come in from time to time. Uh, but I also want to ask you about as you reflect on everything that you've put in that book and all the research that that goes into it, is intelligent, thoughtful life inevitable in the universe? Do the laws of physics just dictate that the universe is going to generate? thoughtful and intelligent life at some point along the way? I don't know. <laughs> I could leave it at that. <laughs> but, uh, but you're a writer, so you <laughs> got to go a little bit further. Yeah. Look, you know, even when, when we look out at the cosmos, there are certain things that are inevitable via the laws of physics as they have played out. And one of those, as you mentioned, is the increase in disorder over time, the increase in entropy. So there are qualities of the world that we've been able to deduce as inevitable, ineluctable consequences of the basic physical laws. But when we talk about complex arrangements of matter, such as living systems, such as thoughtful living systems, there's nothing as far as we can tell that's deeply written into the fundamental laws that requires those collections to emerge. Even on planet Earth, right, long time, the dinosaurs held sway. And it was the chance event of, you know, a meteor impact on Earth that changed the complexion of life on the planet from, from dinosaurs to other mammalian species that ultimately give rise to us who can ask questions like the one that you just asked. But without that meteor, without that historically contingent event, there might not be intelligent life on planet Earth. So it's very hard to answer that question in general, but it is the case that at least there's one data point that suggests that intelligent life, depending on how you judge human beings, has arisen at least on one planet. And therefore there's so many other planets out there that it's easy to let the mind roam wild and imagine that there's other intelligence out there, but Obviously, we don't know the answer to that from an observational experimental standpoint, and we certainly don't know the answer to that from a theoretical physics calculational aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eric, do you mind if I cross talk for, for Oh, no, please do. Go for it. So, so I've spent quite a bit of time with Brian's very beautiful book, Until the End of Time. And, and one of the things that you express so elegantly is that life is a way of exploiting the energy or entropy potential of the universe. And that the difference between an inanimate object and a thinking person, even if we don't invoke some metaphysical concept of soul or will, or even if we just are totally deterministic and physicalists, that we, um, that we do know the distinction between a thinking sentient being and a rock. And you have this beautiful exposition about how if the system permits enough of a complex expression um, that's energetically favorable or entropically favorable, that that's what it's gonna do. Right. So I'm gonna say you kind of did argue in until the end of time, not that it was you know on every planet, obviously, mm -hmm. but that given the right conditions that this was a physical inevitability in the same way as an electron falling down a potential. Yeah. Well, if one goes in that direction, I would even go further. So kind of to bookend both perspectives, my view, as, as Jenna, you know, well, and I don't know if we've actually ever spoken about your view on this. So I'd be curious, you know, my view is that the whole notion of free will is something that is illusory, because the way in which our particles move in our brains determines our thoughts and our decisions. And those particles themselves are governed by the very same physical laws and physical principles. And therefore, everything that we do and think and feel is dependent 
inextricably on conditions that were in place before we were even born, before our collection of particles even existed. So from that point of view, sure, intelligent life would be inevitable because everything is inevitable in the sense that it follows from the yeah. conditions of the universe near the Big Bang and the laws of physics that follow that. But the point I was making previously is that if you just gave me, let's say that I'm standing outside this universe, so there's going to be a contradiction in terms here, but imagine I'm outside the universe and you come to me and you say, this particular universe, I'm going to endow it with the laws of gravity from general relativity, I'll endow it with the laws of quantum mechanics, I'll endow it with the laws of electricity and magnetism from Maxwell and so forth. Can you predict from those laws very generally that there will be intelligent thinking systems that ultimately emerge. I think we'd be hard pressed to answer that question in the affirmative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, right, you can imagine starting with the di different initial data would be very yeah. difficult to predict yep. and a multitude of possibilities when it would and when it wouldn't. Exactly. But it would be predictable in principle, it would just be yeah. very hard. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So let's go back to the beginning. How, how did the Big Bang get started? Brian? <laughs> sure. Well, I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give one moment, then, then Jana will explain yeah. why everything I said was wrong or taken in a different direction. But look, people have been struggling with that question in one way or another for a very long time. I mean, it's no mistake or coincidence that some of the most revered theological texts begin with some statement about how things began. We'd like to anchor our understanding, anchor our understanding of ourselves and the world with some sense of origins. We are, we are wedded to origin stories. And science does have its own origin story, which has the benefit that it actually makes predictions about the world that we can go out and measure. And I'd say the story that scientists are most focused upon today and probably for the last 30 years or so is something called inflationary cosmology, which says that in the very beginning, things, space, time, matter, energy was all crushed together in a very small size. And the conditions were just right to yield something completely unfamiliar to any of us from everyday life. It yields repulsive gravity. So there was a repulsive gravity that pushed everything apart. Normally gravity pulls things together, but there was a repulsive gravity that drove everything apart, causing space to swell, growing larger and larger, incredible growth in a tiny fraction of a second. And that set off the big bang. That's the bang in the big bang. But of course you can always say like, well, wait, where did space come from? Where did time come from? Where did the stuff come from that drove everything apart? And we don't have an ultimate answer of that sort. So if you're really asking the question, why is there something at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? That's a deep question for which we are still struggling and there is no consensus on that. Yeah, I mean- Danny, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I'm, that Leibniz question, why is there something instead of nothing still, still haunts us. Uh, I, I, I can't dispute that what Brian's espousing is, is the most viable, of our understandings of the origin of the universe, but I, but he's also completely right that that's not really getting us the total explanation of like what actually initiated, why did space time catch fire like this? And, um, and I used to sort of subscribe as a young student to general relativity meeting quantum mechanics, um, this kind of idea of the 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 possibility of things appearing out of nothing i used to kind of subscribe to you know physicists aren't supposed to believe things basically but but i was open to this concept that something percolated and caught fire and and then more and more you kind of wonder um well that thing that percolated was literally time starting to tick was literally the existence of space in which things lived. It wasn't like there was this huge space time. There was this huge space time and then something exploded into it. That's definitely not the impression that modern contemporary physicists are trying to promote. It's, it's, it's as though time didn't, there was no meaning to discussing time and space. And the more I've kind of learned from other people about this and listened to new ideas on black holes, which is a surprising 
terrain on which you can actually experiment the, with these ideas, that, um, that it might be something really peculiar like space and time aren't fundamental, that they, they, there's no meaning to them existing until there is matter and quanta, that quanta, I, I, I think of it kind of like um, embroidery where there's tons of stitches and from far away, it looks like a, a thing. But when you look up close, you realize, oh no, that's just an illusion created by the fine stitching and the fine stitching is actually quantum mechanics. So the fact that you thought that there was a space time there was just an illusion because it was actually embroidered by this finer stitching that, that that's actually creating this illusion. Um, so I think I think it's not only the the fundamental question dating way back to Leibniz, and I'm sure every group of social creatures that were painting on caves, it's still with us that question, and it's really pressing. And it and it and it and it's still and yet and yet I think maybe in the first time in history and maybe this is a presumption, but we, we might actually be making headway on that, right? We might actually be be mm. progressing. So you, you mentioned black holes as a as a laboratory, mm -hmm. but they're also fasting objects in and of themselves. They drive a lot of the, you know, the work I do on galaxy evolution is driven by black hole. Give us a, a quick quick course, two minute course in black holes. Well, I mean, obviously Brian could totally lead with that, but I suppose since my book has it in the title, I sort of feel like <laughs> that was coming my, that was lobbed my way. Like if we were in physical, like I would actually catch the ball. Uh, so um, again, black holes are one of those things where you think you know what they are. So I think there's a kind of popular conception. Black holes are incredibly dense objects. They're so dense that not even light can escape. Uh, the escape velocity from the earth is, is more than it is from the moon, but, but from a black hole, it's the speed of light, so you can never escape. That there's, it's not totally wrong, but it's kind of wrong. Black holes aren't objects. In some sense, they're almost like a place, not a thing. And, and even more, black holes are, are empty space. There, there's nothing there. So when we describe the point at which you cannot escape unless you are traveling faster than the speed of light, this thing we've called the event horizon, this region surrounding this kind of energy. Um, there's no matter there whatsoever. And in fact, the Nobel Prize, which was awarded last week to great excitement uh, among, among people in our field, um, in large part, Sir Roger Penrose, who won half the prize for his theoretical work, what he proved is that once this region forms, this region where you have to escape faster than the speed of light because the curvature of space time is so severe, the matter itself can't sit there anymore either because it can't race at the speed of light. So suppose you had a star that collapsed. It creates this dense object. Yes, that to escape, you would have to travel faster than the speed of light. But what he shows is that it can't sit there. It has to keep collapsing. It can no more sit there than it can travel faster than the speed of light. And so what he proves is not only does, well, he doesn't really prove a singularity forms, but that's, that's the prediction of mathematics. What he proves is that what's left behind is an empty event horizon. There's nothing there. There's no object, there's no density. So if I think of a black hole, what I really want to think about is the formation of this region, this place, not a thing this place called the event horizon, where a shadow is cast if it exists in the universe and where you could no more escape from there than you could travel faster than the speed of light. And what happens in the interior, you know, remains a bit of a mystery. And you book those into a little of that. Yeah, I go into the different- Go back a little bit mystery. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so again, what, what Sir, Sir Roger Penrose shows is that the singularity, so from the outside, let's say you, your, your friend, the astronaut goes and explores the black hole and you're out here on the space station and you're thinking the center is a singularity, the center of the sphere is a singularity and exists as a point in space. Your astronaut friend who took this fairly unhappy trip, you know, across a big black hole, so they cross the event horizon safely, not too dramatic. What they find is a singularity isn't a point in space. It's not like they can park themselves and avoid it, right? It's actually in their future. What, what Penrose shows is that the singularity is a point in time in the future and that 
you can no more avoid the singularity than you can avoid the next instance in time that inevitably come and pick. And so I do explore what that experience is like, um, which is well documented in uh, you know science fiction <laughs> and unpleasant. But then we there's also room to talk about well maybe that's not the whole correct story on the interior of black hole. Ryan, I'm wondering what's your what's your take on wormholes? It's what's your take on wormholes? Asked, asked about isn't black hole aren't they wormholes to some other well, point in time and space? You know I'm I'm all for wormholes. Uh, I have nothing against wormholes. And they, are, they actually are a beautiful mathematical solution of the equations that Einstein wrote down in 1915. He gave the world this new theory of gravity, the general theory of relativity, which is the theory within which Jana is describing these properties of black holes, within which Roger Penrose did this analysis to show that certain kinds of configurations necessarily yield these things like black holes. And wormholes are just one other mathematical solution. Now, here's the thing, which Einstein himself stressed. You got to be very careful when you look at the solutions to equations, because some solutions are just math, and some solutions actually describe things in the world. Now, Einstein got it wrong sometimes in distinguishing between those two possibilities, because he did not think that black holes, they weren't called black holes back then, but he didn't think the black hole solution that was found in 1917 by Carl Schwarzschild, the first exact solution to Einstein's equations, describing what we now call a black hole, Einstein did not think these objects were real. He wrote papers trying to prove that they could never exist in the real world. And he was wrong, right? Because there's now incontrovertible evidence of the existence of black holes. We actually have, in quotes, a photograph of a black hole in a galaxy nearby, M87, 55 million light years away, the Event Horizon Telescope. People have seen the image. It was you know, plastered on the front page of the New York Times. So, so Einstein got it wrong in trying to distinguish between solutions that were good for math textbooks and solutions that were relevant to reality. We are in that position when it comes to wormholes. So no one denies that the mathematics allows the possibility of wormholes, but we've never seen one. We don't have any evidence that they exist. And therefore, the only reasonable point of view is to say, OK, the jury is still out regarding whether or not these exotic entities, perhaps I should have said, these are tunnels through the fabric of space, right? A tunnel is the way we get, say, from one side of a mountain to another side by going through a shortcut. We don't have to go all the way up and over. We go right through a tunnel. Similarly, wormholes would be tunnels in the fabric of space. And so it's a beautiful idea. It's a beautiful mathematical solution. But nobody has any idea regarding whether they're real. Yeah. And I, I totally um, agree. I think one of the. One of the things you might be alluding to, Eric, is that um, when people look at the singularity that is predicted, meaning that if I'm falling, the astronaut falling inside the black hole, and I find the singularity is my future and utterly inevitable, and I get flayed apart, and all my quanta are just 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 dispersed, everything hits the singularity, and just as far as the prediction of that goes, just ceases to be, like falls out of existence. Now that is that is anathema to physics. Like that is absolutely saying basically the world is unknowable. And and so most physicists believe that singularity is a false prophecy. That that what it's doing instead is signaling the breakdown of general relativity. And um, and that there is a theory beyond Einstein's that will repair that 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 flaw in the math that we're just following the math to the end. We're not following data to the end. We're following math to the end. And that, that it is a false prophecy and that what we'll find out is something else happens. And so even probably it's gonna have something to do with the kind of work that Brian does, which involves quantum mechanics and string theory and, and, and using, using uh, uh, laws of nature that aren't uh, solely looking at space time. 
But one of the early ideas that did solely look at space time suggested that you could kind of sew the, the black hole interior onto a Big Bang. And it's actually mathematically fine. It's kind of like if you imagine sewing, sewing two surfaces together, the math says, yeah, the surfaces, you could do it. Like it wouldn't, wouldn't be bad. They'd be smooth. They'd smoothly sew onto each other. You could do it. Um, so in other words, you'd fall into the black hole and you'd be flayed and destroyed and turned into your quantum bits, but your quantum bits would then go into a big bang and populate the ecology of like a new universe and where there were new black holes made and maybe new people made and your, your quantum bits would be shared amongst the whole. Um, and that, that's not a prediction. Okay, there's no law of nature that says when you fall into a black hole, it is predicted that this is what would happen. It's simply saying, could I sew these two things together mathematically properly? And you could. And, 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 and a lot of people have a lot of very theoretical reasons for objecting to that as the model. But what's kind of cool about it, just to think about it, is that if you're like in a space station orbiting the outside of this black hole, and this black hole is a certain size on the outside, and your friend, the astronaut, fell in, and they went into a new universe, it's as though the, universe, the black hole is bigger on the inside than the outside. <laughs> like no matter how small that black hole, it could have a whole universe on the inside. So I call it kind of a TARDIS. It's like a black hole TARDIS. <laughs> right. let, me, let me shift gears a little bit to, to a topic that it sort of brought us together, brought the audience together. And as Connor was saying, this event is a combination of the Wisconsin Book Festival and the Wisconsin Science Festival. Um, and, and both of you have spent your careers, large chunks of your careers, engaging a broader audience beyond other physicists and astrophysicists in, in, in your work. Um, you've, you've authored books. Brian, you founded the, the, the World Science Festival. Jana, you're the Chair and Director of Sciences at Pioneer Works, which I'd love to hear more about. So I want if you could both talk a little bit about why you're motivated to engage the broader public in, in the science that you do uh, and what, what hurdles there are to that engagement. Yeah, it's a big question. And, um, you know, there, I think there are a number of answers. Uh, I, I imagine that Jan and I share um, our perspective on this, but actually it's a question that Jenna, you know, I don't think we've ever actually directly discussed this. It's so uh, we've never really directly discussed yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, you, so my, uh, you know, the sort of two, the two motivations that, that I would give, you know, one is look, you, 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 you look out into the world and you recognize that the opportunities that we have and the challenges that we face need to be addressed with a scientific mindset, right? We see what happens in the most devastating way when we ignore science in the face of issues that are deadly, right? We're facing this right now. And this is a vital issue at the moment, but it's simply one example of a whole spectrum of things that we face going forward. So it's absolutely vital that the general public feel sufficiently comfortable with the ideas of science to engage with them. Otherwise, how do you have a democracy if the individuals that have scientific knowledge, the most critical knowledge for determining what our future will be like, if that's in the hands of the few, it has to be in the hands of the many. So, so I think that's one, one way of looking at it. But the other, perhaps from a more personal standpoint is, look, all of us on this discussion know what it's like to have a great breakthrough in science. It's exciting. You write a paper, you send it out, and you know, 50 people or 100 people read it. And, and, and that, that can have a lot of impact going forward, ripple effect and so forth. But that, that's a bestseller when it comes to a science paper. And, and there's something deeply gratifying about stepping outside the academic work for me for part of my time and, and having a conversation which, with a much broader public, having a, a dialogue with people who didn't go to graduate school and aren't gonna study the mathematics, but still get excited about the ideas. And, and for me personally, when I 
you know, you know, in the old days when you could travel and go places, you know, and you'd have a, a book signing somewhere and, and somebody would come up to the table and, and it used to be it was a, like a high school kid and, and, or now, you know, and unfortunately it's a, a faculty member and they say, hey, you know, I read your book when I was 12 or 13 and it really made a difference to the choices that I make. For me, it's among the most gratifying moments because you really feel like you're making a difference in a, in a more broad way than you can with a technical scientific paper. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the hurdles to, to that engagement? Well, the, the hurdles are, 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 are numerous, right? Because especially in the fields that Jana and I write about, the ideas, although deeply compelling, space, time, black holes, Big Bang, you know, those are the ideas that I think have a very easy time capturing the public's imagination. But if you want to explain those ideas in a way that is really accessible, that makes the person feel like they're getting it, it's hard. It's difficult because of the abstract nature of the ideas, you know. So, so I'd say that that really is the biggest hurdle. Yeah. Well, I I, I think Brian addressed that question, so I, I want to uh, say something adjacent, which is um, if you read Brian's book, it is it's just beautifully written. It's as beautifully written as any nonfiction book out there. And that's a rare ability, right? And so in the Thank same you. way that people, yeah, I mean, I was actually looking at it again and because we were gonna have this conversation and that's a rare ability, just like, just like being compelled to do the mathematics of topology on higher dimensional surfaces is a rare ability. And, and, and the generosity of wanting to share that. I think is really the common thread. And it's not a smugness like, oh, we're so clever. We're gonna <laughs> talk amongst ourselves in a tiny institute where only 10 people are invited into the conversation all the time. There's an act of, the compulsion to study physics is pretty strong and hard to describe if you have that compulsion. It's hard to justify, it's hard to explain, it's hard to describe. When people ask you, what's the practical value? What's it worth? Why should anyone care? It's very hard to address those questions. I understand the answers to the questions, but every time I have to dig deep for an answer that I believe other people will understand. But if you read a book, you're not really asking those questions. If, 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 if somebody writes a book that's that beautiful, that's that compelling, where the language is that precise and thoughtful and, um, and original, then nobody's asking, why did you write this book? They're saying, thank you <laughs> for writing this book. And, and um, I hosted Brian actually in conversation recently at Pioneer Works. And that was the experience we had in his book line. The experience wasn't, why did you write this book? I don't understand. Why is it important to humanity? What is it, you know, why do you do this? It, it was a completely different response. It was, thank you for writing this book. You know, it made me question like meaning and, um, humanity and storytelling and the impact of art and thought and 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 the fragility you know the the, the humility of recognizing <laughs> that we're going to come and go you know and so I think that to do that crossover you really have to feel as compelled as strongly compelled and I, I don't think that every scientist who, who, who is a brilliant scientist or an accomplished scientist should necessarily write a book. I don't, I don't think that's how it works. I think you have to have the same compulsion, the same dedication to artistry, the same self-criticism to know when it's not good and to tear it down and try again and tear it down and try again the way we do with science. We push, we push, we push ourselves. So um, that's an adjacent, uh, that's an answer adjacent to your original question. Right. And Jana, you, your first book came out when you were just finishing graduate school. Is that, did I get that right? A little bit after that, but look, bit after. I, was, I was told in no uncertain terms not to do that. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you brought up an, an, interesting, an interesting point in your discussion and, and there's a, actually a question that, that I was asked recently. And so I'm gonna ask, ask the two of you because you were mentioning physics and pursuing physics and having to explain why and sort of justify that pursuit. Mm -hmm. what, 
gave you both of you the the, the permission to pursue physics? Gosh, I think that's a really complicated question in, in, and that we're only under, that I'm only understanding. You know, um, it's wonderful we live in a society that values academic pursuits. It's wonderful that we have universities where the faculty aren't just teaching and being on committees, but they're, it's demanded of them that they be creative and original. Um, but the permission part, I actually think, Eric, that's really complicated, right? And, um, and I think that if you grow up in a certain uh, culture, subculture of, of American culture, you, you, you feel that permission. Um, and I think that if you grow up in different subcultures, you do not, right? And that's one of the things that we're all trying to think about and address, but I, I know you know, in my personal case, I really feel that, um, yeah, I would say in some sense, like the, the people around me gave me that permission. I don't know that I would have known it was an option or pursued it had other people not opened the door, right? And made it possible or supported that choice. Um, yeah, so I don't think that's a simple, simple situation yet, Brian. I don't. Yeah, know. and there's a well, a highly related question is is the one that you alluded to, which is not just the permission to do physics, but the permission to do physics and also to be a writer, right? So you mentioned how early on people were suggesting you not to do that. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, you didn't listen to them and have written beautiful books. I too when I was writing my first book, The Elegant Universe, a book about string theory, I remember being at a string theory conference in Amsterdam and there was a physicist in the room, the hotel room next door and we were just chatting and I told him about it and he was like horrified. He was like, don't do it. He was saying, oh, yeah. he said, the field is too young. You know, you gotta wait till we really understand everything, you know, and, and, and it's just not the right time to, to reveal these ideas to the public as if somehow it was gonna you know, create riots in the street or I, I, don't, I don't know what he was exactly afraid of. But, um, but, but there is this, this, this sense. And um, you know, to my mind, in the end of the day, you do what you do because it feels right. You do what you do because at the end of each day, if you can look at what you did that day and it felt like it had worth and value, whether it was solving equations whether it was writing about the insights that the equations provide us, whether it's a combination of the two, in the end, it really is what Jana said. We have the luxury of living in a society here now that gives us that kind of freedom. And I value that freedom every day. I mean, I thank whatever it is, the powers that be up there in the heavens or the equations or the state of the particles near the Big Bang, whatever it is that determined how things are now, I'm, I'm deeply grateful and do have a deep sense of gratitude for the freedom to be able to pursue things that feel as though they are valuable. We have a, actually a question from the audience. Jenna, why were you advised against writing a book? Well, um, our field of theoretical physics is pretty insular and has like a lot of subcultures, unspoken rules, right? It's what, I mean, it's a culture because there are common themes to how it plays out at every university, in every place, literally internationally. And among those rules is this kind of what, partially what Brian just described, you know, if you're not doing physics, breathing, calculating every waking minute of your life, which of course nobody's actually doing, but that's the premise, then you're somehow stepping out of the monastery. You know, you're, 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 you're not devout. And as a young scientist who was uh, coming out of graduate school, to, to expose that I was not devout was a death knell to my career as a scientist. 
And so the, my very well-meaning, very loving, wonderful mentors who wanted only the best for me told me in no uncertain terms, do not do this at this stage in your career. Um, but I think for me, it was a little different because I, I never 100% felt that I could um, fit into the monastery anyway. So part of me felt freer than some of my colleagues that felt freer. It was like, well, if I'm never gonna, re if the robes are never gonna fit me that well anyway, <laughs> why not you know, take the chance kind of thing? Um, and I'm not gonna say it was, it was a smooth path. It was pretty rocky. It was pretty rocky, okay? Yeah. But I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have had it any other way. And I think that Brian, I'm sure you had this experience. There was a time in our lives where writing a book was, was, was considered a detriment to sort of your career evaluations. So being, doing it before you have tenure and before you're an accomplished professor, yeah. you do it as a, as, a, as a young, like just coming out of graduate school. Um, I was even told in no uncertain terms, none of these things would be considered towards my promotions or um, that they would simply be excluded, which was actually an act of generosity. It was really an act of generosity. They literally said, we're not gonna punish you, but we're not gonna consider it. And I was like, thank you. I'll take that deal. That's a deal I'll take. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I waited. I waited to have tenure before. I wasn't as bold as Jana. And, uh, you know, and, and the culture that she describes is is right on target. I mean, the 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 admoni admonition that I got from some mentors, elders in the field, mm -hmm. it wasn't related to tenure. I already had tenure, but there were folks who said, please don't. And it was flattering. They said, look, we want you to like continue to contribute to the science at the same level that you always have. And if you're going to take out time to write these books, it's not going to be the same. So in that way, it was kind of flattering. But at the same time, you got to live your life. I think you do go around once. And the question is, what are the activities that are going to make your individual, iconic, subjective experience something that you look back on as fulfilling? And for me, just doing the equations 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, which I was doing as a graduate student, absolutely nothing else. Mm -hmm. That life did yeah. not appeal to me to be the only life that I would lead. Right. So when I went to graduate school. I don't think I read a book in like four years. Yeah. And I was devastated. When I came out, I, I did not feel clear headed. I, I, and then don't tell anybody. But during my first postdoc, I spent the first like nine months reading novels and people just saw me at my office. I would have my feet up. I was just reading novels and people were like, are you crazy? What are you doing? But I was like, you do, I am feeding my soul. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get through this postdoc if I don't do this. And it was my peak of like reading peak. I've never read so many books in a month in my life, like month after month. But it's because it's not linear, you can't do physics all the time and not sleep or eat. You know, you can't uh, not walk or move. You can't be hooked up to tubes and do physics as just like Whoa. And so if, if your compulsion is to write and express your feelings about it, to express that connection, to look for bringing other people to share the view of the summit with you or, or the view of the climb, then that will make you do better work down the line is the argument that we should stop thinking about it so linearly. It's not the number of hours you put in, right? It's the quality of the hours you put in. Great, great. We've got a lot of questions. I wanna, I wanna ask one more before I get to the audience questions. And, and sort of, this is the 10th anniversary of the Science Festival. So one of the things we were thinking about as we were putting together this event before I think it was gonna be in person was to pose the question of, what are we gonna be talking about at the 20th Science Festival? So if I think about your books, what is the research that, that you're doing or that you're watching that you think might drive the, the second edition of your book five or 10 years from now? Where, do, where potentially are there are the discoveries that, that either yeah. change what you've written or, or make you say, yes, I was right. Well, for Jana, I think there are there are things that Jana could say in that because it is tightly focused on a very active arena of research, which is black holes. 
my latest book is, as Janet indicated, is a little bit different. So it isn't as tightly tied to the forefront of research, but so I'm going to take your question in a slightly different direction and just say, what will we be talking about at the 20th festival as opposed to one relevant to my book? And I would say that it's really three things. We're going to be talking about the newfound capability and the ethical implications of rewriting the human genome. That's going to be with us in, in a substantial and profound way going forward. We're going to be talking about advances in general artificial intelligence, which are going to create thinking machines or machines that appear to be thinking in a way that's gonna radically change our experience in the world. And I believe we also will be talking about something that Jana alluded to, which is a deeper understanding of what space and time are. I think there's a chance we'll get to a place where space and time will be recognized to not be fundamental to rather emerge from more basic ingredients like the stitches of quantum mechanics that Jenna made reference to. I think we're gonna understand that far better. And because of that, we may have a completely different paradigm for the fundamental laws. All fundamental laws now presuppose space and time, things within an arena that change through time. That's how the laws are set up. We may find a completely different paradigm which does not need space and time from the get-go. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely on, on all counts. Um, so with, with the book on black holes, I, I, I do get into the hard stuff of are black holes fundamental or do they emerge from quantum mechanics? I mean, it sounds like, how did you get there from the beginning of this? Like, how did you get there? But that is where the discussion is right now. and. It's not concrete enough yet. We don't have enough discoveries yet, but it, it, it feels so compelling. There's something about it that is exciting enough to physicists to pursue it. It could turn out to be a dead end, but it doesn't feel like that right now, I have to say. It feels extremely promising that one day we'll understand that black holes emerge from quantum mechanics. Crazy, right? But, it's, but, but we know other phenomena like that, like the temperature in this room is not a thing. There's no such thing. There's no particle in the universe that has as a quantity temperature. It's the collective behavior of, of actually individual atoms. And so it could be something like that. But I agree also, CRISPR is fascinating. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to um, Manuela Chaponchier and Jennifer Doudna for CRISPR. Man, when I learned CRISPR, I just thought, well, if I had been a young student on the cusp of like physics, I, I've never been drawn towards biology in part because, I mean, I love it as a passive observer. It's fascinating. But as an active researcher, I don't really have, I like one sentence from which I can derive this. You know? And CRISPR starts to have that feeling. I, I feel that physicists are gonna get into biology and biologists are gonna get into physics more than ever. And, and we'll stop thinking about these fields so rigidly as departments in different buildings. And it, it's not unrelated, Eric, to your previous question about being writers. I mean, why do we think it's so shocking that somebody who does math writes a book? Like, why is that so shocking to us? And I, I think in the future, this, this, there will be a porousness between scientific disciplines and intellectual disciplines that will allow us to progress more um, because we're forced to utilize all of those tw different tools. And, um, and so I hope in 10 years, did you say 10 or 20 years? I said five to 10. Okay, let's take 10. I hope in 10, 10 years that you're asking people, how did you go from being a biologist to a physicist? And they'll explain this interesting trajectory that led them to be both. Okay, um, fantastic. Let me get to a couple of questions from the, from the audience. Um, what are the top three takeaways you want people to know after reading your books? I'll do you, Ryan. You want to do mine? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I am so looking forward to seeing your book. Nobody has sent it to me and I couldn't get a hold of it because it doesn't seem to be published yet. When is your book being published? November 10th. November 10th. I am today. I, it occurred to me that that was the case. And today, just right before this, I emailed you a set of galleys. You did? Oh, well, thank you. So I, 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 I was, just before this, it was like, oh my God, has Brian not seen the book? The one thing I can say, even without reading your book, I know it's going to be wonderful because you're a wonderful writer. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. 
but uh, unfortunately I can't, I can't go into any more detail than that. So three takeaways, if I was to say in my own book, I don't know, I'm not much on the three takeaway paradigm, but I would want people to have a clearer sense of how they fit into the grandest possible story, which is the story from the beginning of time to the end of time. Where do we fit in on that cosmic timeline? How do we come to be? Why do we have the kinds of obsessions and the kinds of anxieties and the kinds of, of focuses? Why do we have those qualities? Can we explain them from an evolutionary perspective? And as we turn and pivot toward the future, what's gonna be in the long run? Will we stick around? Will matter stick around? The answer as far as we can tell is likely no, which I think has a profound impact on your own thoughts about why you're here and where we are going. Jenna? Is it three that I'm looking for? You can, you, I'm sure we could do one or two. Okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start with this one. Um, so when I when I when I was writing this book, I um, I was working on some illustrations. I kind of sketched out how I wanted the illustrations to look, and then I decided to contact this friend of mine who's an artist. Her name is Leah Halloran, and she's a wonderful artist. She she lives in Los Angeles, and I called Leah, and I was like, "These will look so much better if if you painted, <laughs> if you painted." <laughs> and so Leah painted 23 original artworks. Oh, wow. Very large scale, they're gorgeous. In the, Brian, when I sent you the galleys today, I literally said, as a joke, just look at the pictures. Uh, okay. But then I was like, no, I'm serious. Just look at the pictures. <laughs> how, how large are they in the cheap painting? Are they? I, I, ha I, ha I haven't, obviously it's COVID, so I haven't been to the studio, but they're, you know, they're significant paintings. It's a very wet, loose, watery process in this cyanotype blue. And then we convert them in black and white for the book. But even my author image was painted by Leah. Um, and so, so what's the takeaway from that is that this artifice in, in between art and science it, it is an, it, it's just an artificial divide. I don't think I'm doing art when I'm writing about black holes. I can't, I don't like that trite that trite sort of trying to combine the subjects. But does art belong in my book by an artist? Yeah, I'm not claiming I'm the artist and she's not claiming she's the physicist, but, um, but I feel that it made the book much more exciting for me. I wanted, to, I wanted to write it better. I wanted to make it better. And it's gonna be this tiny little object. You know? So I think of the book now as a physical thing, right? And, and that's, that was neat to me. And then I think your question was meant to be more intellectual and more conceptual. And I think what I want people to walk away thinking about is that we think we know stuff, but almost everything we know is really like a provocation to try to figure out the next thing. <laughs> and that's what I feel like black holes are for us now. We, we think we know them now. We've taken pictures of them, as Brian said. We've, We've heard them colliding. We've, we've met, we, this Nobel Prize was because of observations where we've detected them, but they remain provocations for things that we don't yet understand. And, uh, and I would love for that to be a takeaway. Yeah. So a couple of questions actually about, about younger people. So one is, have either of you considered writing books for kids? Brian to start that curiosity. And then the, the, the related question is, what's your advice for young people who are deeply passionate about physics. Well, I'm just I'm just barging in for a second to say that Brian absolutely has written a book for younger people. And and my my first book was called How the Universe Got Its Spots after the Just So stories, like how the leopard got its spots because originally the idea was to write a story for kids. It ended up not being that, but that's what the title was derived from. But Brian, you've you've written a book for young people. Yeah, I wrote a well, a, a book is perhaps too grandiose a term. It's a, <laughs> it was a very short story that we turned into an illustrated book for younger audiences called Icarus at the Edge of Time, which is a it was a futuristic reimagining of the classic Greek myth of Icarus, where a boy, rather than donning wax wings and flying too near the sun against his father's warning, the boy builds a spaceship against his father's warning and goes out to the edge of a black hole. So we now have a nice 
interface with Jana's book and goes on a joy ride there and he survives it by not crossing over this event horizon that Jana was making reference to. But there's a weirdness of time that Einstein taught us, which means in this case that the boy spent an hour near the edge of this black hole, but when he came back, it was 10,000 years into the future. So his dad is gone, everything he knows is gone and enters a completely different life. So it was a kind of um, attempt not to teach about black holes per se, but rather through a journey for the reader to just feel the wondrous power of black holes to impact reality. And I should say, although it was published as a book, the main reason I wrote it was for live performance. So I wrote it as a as a the libretto, if you will, for a live stage presentation. Philip Glass wrote the original orchestral score and two wonderful filmmakers from the UK, Al and Al, created a wonderful film to accompany the live performance. And so that's something that that we've had like 60 or 70 performances around the world and that. And we're now in the midst of part two of this story, which unlike sort of the Hollywood sequel that you just do for the sake of doing it, this one, it turns out, does take the story full circle in a metaphorical and literal way, as it turns out. And so that will be coming out as a book in its own right in the next couple of years, I think. And the performance piece now will be parts one and part two. Yeah, so that really is meant for for young audiences or older audiences. And let me just quickly reference the second part of the question was what do I, what advice do I give to, to young folks who want to go into physics? It's very simple, which is this, get excited about the forefront of ideas by reading Jana's book, reading some of my books, reading some of the other great popularizations of science that are out there, but you got to learn the basics inside out. You can't skimp on classical physics or basics of quantum mechanics or the basics of statistical mechanics. I can't tell you the number of students that have come to my office after reading my book or somebody else's book and say, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to do <laughs> physics research, you know, and, and you can't unless you're able to do what Jan is showing you up there on the screen. And so, and so that's really the advice. Um, and it's a pleasure to learn those things. Right, so I, I like this two-step idea that you read books that are way ahead of where you're gonna be for many years, that give you a glimpse from a high view, you know, of some, some, some parapet where you can imagine one day I'll be able to make that climb myself. But the climb itself isn't totally horrible. It's actually, it's a pleasure to learn <laughs> like Newtonian mechanics. Yeah. And, and electromagnetism and fundamental quantum mechanics. And you should appreciate that each one of those things in the curriculum are there because they're so profound. They might not be incredibly fun and glamorous, but they are so profound. And the more you learn, the more you're gonna go back to that and think about, oh, the principle of relativity existed with Galileo. And you're gonna go back and think about, oh, uh, unification of field theories happened with Maxwell and electromagnetism in the 1800s. And so, so just to appreciate, just to appreciate those various steps, there's a lot of beauty along the way. Speaking of the climb, we've got a question that, that asks, what was your defining moment to learn perseverance in a difficult subject? Oof, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, if I gave it more thought, I perhaps would come out with something more appropriate. But what comes to mind, because Jana was mentioning just a moment ago, how there is value in reading books in physics, say, that are beyond your current level. You know, when I was a sophomore in college, Stephen Hawking came and gave a lecture. And I actually had never heard of Stephen Hawking before that lecture. I was somehow out of the loop and uh, went to his lecture and it was a time when he could still speak a little bit. And he had a graduate student that put his ear next to Stephen's mouth and would translate into a more discernible form for the audience, which meant it went really slow. So a student like me could follow it a little bit better. So that was good for me. And I remember after that lecture being so inspired by that, that I immediately went to the bookstore and I bought a book on the general theory of relativity that was way beyond what I was able to understand. But I would carry this book with me 
almost everywhere I went, it was in my book bag. And I'd pull it out and I'd like look at these symbols and I'd see these ideas. And I just said to myself, I want to one day really understand what's in this book. And I wasn't prepared at that moment, couldn't possibly do it. But, you know, I stayed with it and learned the necessary background material to get to that point. And yeah, when I finally got to the Einstein equations, somewhere in that book, it was Steven Weinberg's book and the general theory of relativity happens really early on about page 75 or something like that. It was a thrilling moment having, as Jana using the metaphor, climbed the mountain, slowly but surely climbed the mountain, got to that point that for me earlier on was just a dream to get there. So, so that kind of experience is formative for, I think, all of us. All of us have different versions of that, but to look at something that seems completely opaque and to put in the effort, the perseverance to get to a point where not only is it not opaque, but you understand it. Not only do you understand it, but you can start to do things with it. Yeah, that's kind of a, a thrilling progression. Mm -hmm. Jana, you wanna add anything? Well, I was not that kid like with the chemistry set in my basement. And I think now it would be different, but I never self-identified as a scientist prior to the moment that I totally, I, it was like, it's like a switch was thrown. I went from having no, I really, like never would have identified myself as a scientist to being like, oh man, I'm totally, this is it. This is what I'm gonna do. And I was halfway through college before I discovered physics. And, um, and I was studying, you know, I, I think like Brian, I love to be a student of ideas and, and, and the world and other books and just other things, but I didn't have any background in math and science and I was in a philosophy class. Um, and I've told the story a couple of times. I hope I'm not repeating myself, but I was so frustrated. I was a philosophy major. I was so interested in the big ideas, but I was so frustrated that everybody was still arguing about what Kant meant. What did Kant mean when he said, I, I just was, was very disillusioned. And one day this, uh, this, young prof this young aspiring professor comes to give a job talk um, and talks about quantum mechanics and free will and determinism and Einstein. And all of these people who had dominated the conversation up to that point in the semester became very quiet. And I thought, oh, there's something to this. <laughs> And I now will tell you that nobody in physics who has learned relativity is saying, what did Einstein mean? What did he mean? We're saying the opposite. We're like, I get it and I can teach it to you and you can teach it to the next generation. And we could forget Einstein, I hope we don't, but we could and it wouldn't matter because we know exactly what he meant. And so that was the, that was the moment for me that was very defining. And I have to tell Brian because he'll be kind of amused is that young aspiring professor was David Elbert. Wow, that's great. That he is now a professor at Columbia yeah. in philosophy of physics, yeah. Oh, great, great. Well, I wanna be respectful of the time. This has been, been absolutely wonderful. Thank you both for, for joining us. Uh, your books are for Brian Greene. It is Until the End of Time. And I actually, I actually got it right here, if you have it. Uh, it's it's a it is a great book uh, and a, a fun journey and story through physics and religion and and how the brain works and it, it, it and the Empire State Building which I will never look at the same <laughs> way. Uh, and uh, and Jana's book coming out November tenth. Oh yeah, seven days into the fall of Rome. What could go wrong? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Seven days into the fall of Rome, Black Hole Survival Guide. Like if you can't survive the fall of democracy, you can survive a black hole. That's beautiful. We, uh, That's we perfect. Very right. <laughs> so, so thank you, thank you very, very much for, for spending an evening with us. To the audience, thank you. Thank you for participating. Uh, Connor, and thank you. And we'll turn it oh, back Oh, thank over. you, Eric. What a lovely conversation. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Brian, for being here. Uh, I just want to say, Jana, that when I was in law school, which is what I did before I did this job, um, uh -huh. I decided I cannot just read this for three years and I would read I'd read while I walked I'd read on the bus I'd read like in the class before like three minutes before and everyone was like what are you doing here you care about books now I do this job and I'm super happy and it's great um, I'm glad it worked out for you but I you know that Thank there is a you. role for novels in just daily life so um, yeah and uh, all of your books will come uh, 
probably in a bundle, Brian's and Jana's books together, so expect them in November. Um, thank you, Brian and Jana, so much for being here. Eric, uh, relationship with the Science Festival is always wonderful. I'm so glad we got to have you feature tonight. Um, we have one more event left in the fall celebration of the Wisconsin Book Festival. It is at 8.30. We'll be joined by Terry Tempest Williams, the nature writer, conservationist, and general memoirist. Um, we can't wait for that. And we have about 11 events uh, going on throughout the rest of the fall, so please check wisconsinbookfestival.org for more. Um, we thank you so much for being here tonight and look forward to seeing you again. Have a great night. Thanks, Thanks.